Hi folks and welcome back to Did Sid Barrett series and uh, this will be kind of an interlude episode I would like to bridge between the topic of T-Rex and Mark Bolin and into the next topic that I kind of want to take on which is the Beatles and obviously the Beatles are the kings of uh, English pop music at the time and influenced very very many people but they also had established a significant I guess you could say music empire through Apple Records etc and I suspect we're kind of quite involved in the development of a number of bands so perhaps you know there are some connections to be made between Pink Floyd and Sid Barrett and the Beatles and of course as we've mentioned previously in our Peeling Sid series during the recording of Piper at the Gates of Dawn they were in the same studio as uh, the Beatles so um, I'm going to try and tear that apart and take a look at some of the Beatles music and we'll, and we'll kind of trace some influences of, of one another. Uh, now I would like to go through a kind of a few announcements real quick before we move on to the topics of discussion and those will be kind of various for this episode. The first is we have a number of new subscribers, quite a few actually, so thank you if you're a new subscriber. If you know folks that are interested in these topics and these types of music, uh, uh, feel free to forward these along and share ideas. Uh, as I said, I think Mr. Barrett is a person that is very much worth studying and not just because of the music. I, I think there is a lot more to Mr. Barrett, um, not just as a poet and not just as a musician, but also as a person that are quite interesting and perhaps can help, um, help kind of explain the nature of uh, bigger picture things, I, I guess I should say. At least um, he has been for me. So uh, let's discuss a few things. One is in our Peeling, Seri uh, Peeling Sid series episode on Arnold Lane, Small Fox 74 discovered an anagram in the name Arnold Lane. And we were discussing in that episode that Arnold Lane's a little bit odd. I was trying to figure out what was going on there. We have noted a proclivity by Mr. Barrett to use. Uh, uh, not just specific words but also to position words and to use uh, abbreviations to possibly mean things uh, you can check out our uh, dark side of Oz kind of idea and small fox 74 recognized that by by uh, repositioning letters you can get non real lady <laughs> which is uh, so appropriate that it's quite obvious and it's a wonderful discovery that they've made in my opinion and it's entirely in tune with the theme of the song so uh, I appreciate that very much and I just want to point out of course that this is indicative of the benefit of working with other people that they can see things that you might see or miss and that they have uh, other ways of looking at things so whether it's there intentionally and placed there on purpose by Mr. Barrett, I don't know. You'll have to decide that on your own. But it is quite a coincidence and uh, I think it's a wonderful note and a wonderful discovery that they made. Perhaps other people have found it before, I don't know. But uh, I appreciate the contribution, Small Fox. So the second um, kind of item of note is that from our Peeling Sid Barrett Vegetable Man, episode uh, we have from uh, posted by airwaves official a Swedish version of vegetable man which I think is wonderful I've listened to it a number of times uh, I think it's great and I think they did a really great job with it and essentially what they've done is they've looked at our peeling Sid Barrett vegetable man episode where we tied in the photograph of mr. Barrett with the uh, green onions covering his face and mentioned how that is similar to Rene Magritte's painting, Son of Man, and which has the apple in front of his face. And they've done kind of a claymation heavy sounding video, and I'll get to that in just a moment, that shows a number of Magritte's uh, paintings and images from his paintings mixed together with their uh, claymation video. Uh, and they've done a wonderful job. I highly recommend you check them out. I think it's wonderful what they've done. And, uh, I guess I couldn't say much more about it other than that. And I will just kind of point out also that I think it's accurate that they have taken a very heavy sounding form, a Swedish 
a version of Vegetable Man and uh, made a video in that way. And the reason for that is because Vegetable Man is a heavy song. And I would like to point out to you that most people in the industry and outside of the industry, when you talk about the development, the development of hard rock and heavy metal, they will point you to Helter Skelter by the Beatles as a breakthrough song released in 68, developed and released July through September of 68. Well, Vegetable Man very much predates that song. And Vegetable Man is a much heavier sounding song. So if you're going to credit people and note influences, I just want to point out that that song that was hidden from people for a very, very long time, I'm not sure exactly when it was finally released as an official version. There were bootlegs of it for a long time. But I think in 2016, they finally released a version of, of Vegetable Man. Why was that song being hidden? I don't know. But I will point out that uh, when you listen to it now, it's a very, it, it sounds like a precursor to heavy metal and hard rock, much more so than Helter Skelter, in my opinion. So uh, at any rate, if you would check out, I'll post, um, I'll, I'll throw it in the description. I'll, I'll throw a link into their video of Vegetable Man. And just my opinion, you should go check it out. I think they did a really good job. Okay, so let's move on with our topics. And what I would like to do is I would like to mention, of course, that the next video I'm going to kind of tear into the Beatles and the Pink Floyd, Sid Barrett associations and try and figure out whatever kind of connections I can make there. Of course, Pink Floyd and the Beatles are recording in the same studio at the same time when, when Pink Floyd was making uh, Piper at the Gates of Dawn. And we also know that uh, there are some connections from our Peeling Sid series um, with several artists and uh, uh, at least one concert that was put on by Pink Floyd that members of the Beatles, I believe Paul McCartney and John Lennon, uh, attended. So they would have known the band to some degree. How much so? Who knows? But uh, that'll be my next episode. So what I'd like to do is kind of go through some topics, things that I missed from the previous two episodes on Mark Boland and T-Rex or things that I deliberately left out and I'll, I'll uh, explain that here in just a moment. So the first song that I'd like to discuss is One Inch Rock. We discussed this kind of uh, a lot in the previous episode and I would like to point out that the luggage eyes and a Roman nose uh, aspect to the song. I avoided discussing Roman nose by the way because I didn't know if this song was being utilized in a derogatory way. It would be very easy to say that someone has, you know, a one inch rock and that they have luggage eyes and a Roman nose. You know, is this a derogatory song? And so I'm kind of fearing that as I'm discussing the song. And I'm not saying that I'm fearing that. I'm just kind of not discussing it, which is, um, it's a little cowardly, I, I, I should say. I'm um, not proud of the fact that, uh, but I wasn't sure what was being stated, so I avoided it. Uh... I, I'm now more clear on this, and I just want to point out something. Mr. Bolin and his family were part Jewish, and I didn't know this, but I was watching more documentaries on him. So now I understand that the Roman nose aspect is very likely a term of endearment that's extremely personal to Mr. Bolin, which means not only that it's more likely that he wrote the song, but also it adds an aspect of beauty to it that I wasn't aware of previously. So. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that in the song, and I'm happy that uh, it's there, and I should have tackled that, I guess, head on and not shied away from it. But when I see those types of things, my, my natural inclination is to avoid the controversy of the statement and to simply try to uh, throw in my thoughts on what aspects of it I understand. And I didn't fully understand it, so I avoided it. Okay. So let's go ahead and move on then. And what I would like to discuss are a couple of songs that uh, we have discussed previously. Uh, well, actually, first, let's discuss one other thing. We, we, we mentioned also the June Child story of Mr. Barrett coming and visiting her uh, in the morning after having some kind of run in from a park. And that story is, is relayed in uh, Mr. Palacios's book. So uh, we referenced that in the previous video, and I would just like to point out again, we did 
did Sid Barrett Led Zeppelin IV, which has Misty Mountain Hop on it. And if you look at the lyrics for Misty Mountain Hop, look at the story. It matches the story that June Child has relayed. Going to the park, being involved with some substances, getting busted by the cops, you know, not knowing what time it is, showing up really early. All of those ideas are tied within June Child's story. They almost exactly match the story that's relayed in the song Misty Mountain Hop by Led Zeppelin. So just pointing that out. Okay, so, uh, and we did discuss that to some degree in our Did Sid Led Zeppelin 4 uh, discussion. Okay, so um, now the real reason why I wanted to put together this episode, and the reason for that is that uh, I woke up after, the day after, of course, it's always right after you do something, and uh, I woke up and I realized right a white swan is relaying the idea of riding a white swan and of course again pronoun trouble so in let's look at the lyrics for ride a white swan if, if you don't mind pull up ride a white swan again on your phone let's take a look at the lyrics the directives are ride in and out on a bird or uh, in the skyways ride it on out Ride in and out is what I hear, but that's not what they have for these lyrics. But what I hear is ride in and out, like you're a bird. <clears throat> and the next line, which again, I somewhat uh, avoided because I didn't totally get it. But let's kind of continue on. There, the, the next verse states, wear a tall hat like a druid. Well, who's wearing a tall hat? Of course, Mark Bolin is wearing a hat. Is this a song to himself? <laughs> Uh, well, no, it's not, right? Because write it on out like you were a bird. Wear your hair long, you can't go wrong. So this is kind of a directive. Uh, the interesting aspect of this, one, the first point that I'll kind of make, is that this seems to be a song about directives for someone to be doing. Now, the way that this can be understood is, of course, if you understand that the swan is tied to the the spirit of song as we discussed in our previous video and in our discussion on uh, Did Sid Barrett Metal and the song specifically A Pillow of Winds where we analyze the swan symbol and I'll give you a from J.E. Searlows I'll give you a breakdown of some of the notes of a swan symbol but of course the swan is intrinsically tied to the idea of music so writing a white swan would be like writing the spirit of music or writing a muse and it seems to be a directive in some ways. So uh, there's two things there that are that are interesting to me. If if Mr. Bolin is mentioned that he is writing a white swan, why doesn't he say I write a white swan? He seems to be directing other people to write a white swan. And uh, of course, if someone else is associating themselves with a white swan, with the spirit of the white swan then writing a white swan could mean that he's writing that person's uh, inspiration, which is, uh, I guess you could say, a little bit interesting, isn't it? And we have mentioned this before in our discussion of James Joyce's uh, um, uh, collection of poetry and chamber music, specifically verse 4 and we we've discussed this before but I'll, I'll throw it up here again for you to look at now i did a song on this you can check it out if you like but it references the shy star and the shy star which is holding back and there's a song and the object of affection doesn't know from whom this song is coming from and the reference is of course that they are the singer of the song they are the maker of the music Quite an interesting combination, especially when you consider here that this seems to be advice to Mr. Bolin, either from himself or if you if you follow along with the idea that perhaps someone else is providing influence, you write in and out on the white swan. Interesting. So um, I guess the last thing that I would kind of like to discuss is... The nature of the the color white which of course isn't a color 
and I discussed that the sunshine would be yellow. There are numerous references to silver sunshine, etc., in Mr. Boland's music. In particular, in um, The Wizard, there's mention of silver sunlight, and um, there are numerous references to silver uh, light and moonshine in Mr. Barrett's music in a song like uh, Arnold Lane. So uh, this, this kind of consideration of the color of light, and of course it's on the Dark Side of the Moon cover, this idea of white light breaking up into its many constituent forms, the various forms of light and colors of light that we see in our visible range, it's tied to white visible light. So what is meant by that exactly? Why, why would you write a white swan? Um, I would like to point out the possibility, of course, well, uh, obviously swans are white, <laughs> so most swans are pretty much uh, entirely white, but the nature of the swan being white and writing that uh, white swan would tie in possibly with the idea of um, good and evil, very simply. So, of course, um, in, in, in media and in movie form, the colors white and black have always, uh, well not always, but are generally used to show who's the good guy and who's the bad guy, or who's good and who's evil. In particular, you know, movies like, uh, even in the future, movies like Star Wars. So you have Darth Vader who's wearing black and Luke Skywalker who's wearing white. This can be a little bit perturbing to people to think that like a specific color would be representative of the right way and a specific color would be representative of a wrong way. Uh, and I would just like to point out really quickly that um, the nature of this discussion is quite deep. It's easily kind of uh, misunderstood and misconstrued, so I'm going to try to be careful with it here. For me, the idea of wearing white is tied to the idea of wearing all colors. In other words, recognizing the value of all things in the world around you. It's a very positive idea. Uh, of course, black is tied to no color, but the absence of light. And for that reason, uh, for many, many uh, religions, old and young, it's a representative representation of absence of the sun. And absence of the sun, of course, is captured in things like Dark Side of the Moon. It's specifically referenced in uh, the at the end of the album, but the sun is eclipsed by the moon. This idea of light and dark. And... Um, it's a very, very deep discussion, and one that I, I, I don't feel like I can go into too much, but I would kind of like to point out that you have heroes of old, uh, and spe uh, specifically, I want to I point to the idea of other heroes, and uh, just really quickly discuss the nature of what is being relayed in those stories. So, one of my favorite heroes from old stories is Achilles. Now, when most scholars break down the heroes of the Iliad, they will re they'll they'll discuss Ulysses as this rational man who knows his duty, who is meant to be doing very specific activities, who keeps a level head. And this person, uh, Ulysses, is of course uh, lionized by the Romans and uh, the later Roman Empire as this servant of duty, which is a, a very, very important to the Romans. But I want to indicate the possibility that earlier uh, versions of the story and interpretations of it may have understood that Achilles is the real hero of the Iliad. Why and how so? Does he deserve to be the hero? What is the meaning of this idea, not just within Achilles, but within the Bible itself, of the cloak of many colors? Of course, uh, the cloak of many colors is referenced in the Bible as something that represents, uh, uh, I guess you could say, rulership over many different types of people. But I, I want to point out that it can mean something else entirely. It can mean, as Achilles understood, that life is temporary. And that it has to be fully enjoyed. 
It has to be fully experienced in all its colors, the good and the bad. It has to be something that is uh, artistically creative, that is involved, that pulls the spirit from us that we are involved with, we create within it, we are making things, we are, we are influencing the lives of others in a positive way. We are allowing other people to influence us in a positive way. We recognize the values of all those things. And we are not at war with the world around us. Now, one of the ideas that I'd like to kind of present here as, a, as an aside of, of sorts, I suppose, is the idea of the first commandment of the Old Testament. And that is that you should have no gods before your God. Now, as I've mentioned before, I do consider myself to be a Christian, though I'm not tied to any uh, dogma or organization. So um, what exactly is my intent with this statement? And this is kind of a tricky one. Uh, if you adhere to the idea that our experience, our world, our planet, our universe were created by an entity, <laughs> and that entity developed those for our benefit and they were good, or if you choose to believe that they just evolved over, you know, billions of years. I, I won't say one's right and one's wrong. I'm not going to get into that. What I am going to get into is the idea of the wisdom that's, a, that's tied within the idea of having nothing before something else that is intrinsically valuable. So in this case, putting no other person before your significant other, quite wise, right? Uh, you wouldn't go around treating other people better than your significant other, would you? That would be unwise. Uh, would you go around treating other worlds as if they're more important than this planet itself? Um, that would be unwise as well. And this, of course, is important because of virtual reality. The nature of electronic design, and, and I recognize that uh, this medium is providing benefits and also has uh, significant shortfalls and dangers that are, are, are tied to it. But we are biological creatures, and as such, we need to interact with one another. We need to experience the totality of the world, go outside and do things. There are aspects of this that are, that are so tied within the idea of being human that we don't even know how to measure them yet. And yet we know that there are people that will seek to create uh, virtual realities and uh, I'm not going to say it's entirely uh, bad or negative for human existence but I will say that it needs to be understood and limited we need to recognize the importance of the physical creation of this planet and our physical immersion in it so that we do not put another creation ahead of what is what we are intrinsically tied to that's an important kind of a distinction. Now, Achilles, of course, knew he was doomed to die. This is the reason why he's a hero. He knew he was doomed to die. But he decided he would go to fight uh, the Trojan War anyway. And he did so to the utmost of his ability. It's very, very much like a story about Hannibal Barca, in my opinion. This idea that you're up against it, you know, this, this great difficulty in life that ends the same way for all of us. And regardless of what our ideas are about what happens after we die, we certainly all need to make the most of our time. If you believe that there's more after life, you'll be judged on what you do with your life. And if you don't believe that there's anything after life, you will judge what you have done with your life. And in that way, we need to experience the totality of life in order to become heroic, to be heroes in this life. And that involves many, many uh, different ways of looking at the world. I think some people, some people uh, like Achilles, perhaps in times before were much wiser about this. And perhaps this is some of the ideas that are tied up within the romantic poetry of the romance era. That's a, perhaps a reason why so many of the romance era poets were throwing back ideas to the ancient Greeks because they understood that, that their belief system was not an absolutist belief system. Just an idea. I'll just throw that out there. 
at any rate, um, I guess one of the last things that I kind of would like to finish up with is this idea of, you know, Darth Vader and darkness and nihilism. Uh, it it's quite pervasive in many ways and Nietzsche spent a lot of time considering this very specific idea of passive nihilism. In other words, nothing is absolutely good or evil anymore and um, what's the point now? So what is the point of anything? And in a way, uh, the goal is to remove activity because there's no point to it anymore. and. That form of nihilism, uh, Nietzsche discusses quite a bit. It's very complex, and I'm not going to be able to explain it very well. Uh, I'm sure you can check out Nietzsche and nihilism. There's probably a lot of videos on, on that very specific topic. What I would like to point to is the idea that through recognizing the value of many colors, which perhaps is the intent of uh, something symbolically like the cover to Dark Side of the Moon. The idea of the experience of, of many, many colors, which is not only uh, a philosophical idea, I'll just point out, of course, that it, it it's something that's intrinsically understood by people that are painters. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Uh, the nature of combinations of light, the nature of combinations of colors tied to the experiences of life is a, it's a wonderful visual effect for a philosophy. And that the very, very many colors of experience in life need to be embraced and understood and, and provided to one another so that we help one another to uh, experience our own lives. And the nature of that life is varied, as we all are varied. But what should not be happening is that we, that we each are living in this kind of, uh, I guess you could say, forgotten darkness, this kind of idea of isolation and uh, not, not physical necessarily, but philosophical isolation, and that we no longer have uh, an anchor to tie to. There is solid ground to stand on, and that solid ground is, of course, shared experience and uh, shared development, and in that way, uh, we can avoid the dangers of nihilism and live more fulfilling lives. At any rate, uh, just some side topics that are kind of my own. Those, I think, kind of tie in a bit with the music uh, you can see. Specifically, the song Ride a White Swan. So hopefully now that idea of riding a white swan makes a little bit more sense to you. Uh, riding this, this mini-colored inspiration uh, in and out of a, uh, in and out of a sun... Uh, in and out of a sunbeam, I believe is the lyrics. Uh, what an interesting statement. Again, there's reference to sun. So in and out of the sun, we've mentioned the card, the sun, the tarot card, the sun. And it's its relation to the material happiness and uh, of the world, the absolute happiness of the world. So at any rate, uh, that hopefully explains the song a little bit more. And uh, it's a small thing, but perhaps it add some value to it, and I will check in with you folks later uh, with a, a kind of a Beatles breakdown. So hopefully you've enjoyed this, and I will talk to you later.